The following sermon is rated PG-13. Viewer discretion is advised. Parents, please make use of our children's programming now. I've struggled with depression and anxiety on and on for most of my life. And as a Christian, I struggled with this. It used to confuse me because I thought that depression wasn't for people who love the Lord. Where's this inner joy that I was supposed to have? But I was wrong. Christians struggle with it. A few years ago, I was struggling with anxiety and depression more than I ever had before. Panic attacks were hitting me just weekly, and at that point I couldn't manage them on my own. Um, Even the thought of getting up on stage and leading worship at Experience Life sent me into panic mode. We had um, just launched the Amarillo campus at that time, and I was driving back and forth every week to lead worship. But for some reason, even the drive, that you know, two hour drive, absolutely scared me to death. And I saw myself having panic attacks almost every Saturday night before church. Um, I was losing control. And so again, I went to a new doctor who prescribed even more medication. And this time it was a lot stronger than the other kinds that I had taken before. And I remember this one day, um, I hadn't been taking the medication very long, so it hadn't taken effect yet, but um, I think it was a Saturday night and I was just in the depth of my my panic that I, I couldn't control it and I was thinking about going to Amarillo and driving there and I just, I looked down at the bottle of the pills and counted them and thought, I wonder how many of these pills it would take. I, I thought, would this be enough pills to, to end it? I mean, the, would this take away all the panic and the pressure and just the overwhelming sense of just hopelessness that I felt. But I, I never really had those kinds of thoughts before. It's it's so scary to think how easily and, and quickly a disease like depression can just trick your mind. But in the midst of my confusion that, that one day, I was able to hold on to the truth that I knew in my heart that even though I did not feel like it that day, and there were several days that I didn't feel like it, I knew that that Jesus was there for me. And so that night came and went, and uh, I kept taking my medication, and it did what it was supposed to. It worked, and I started to feel better. But not too long after that, um, my husband and I found out that we were expecting a baby. And among the thoughts of just absolute joy and excitement for what was about to happen in our life, on the inside, um, I was pretty terrified because I knew that this meant I couldn't take the medication anymore. Um, And it wasn't until that point in my life that um, I fully realized my need for God to reign over my struggles with depression and anxiety. I never really asked Him to help, really, before. When I think about it, all the times before, I just controlled it on my own. Um, But while God can and does use medication to help At this point, he was telling me so clearly, Danielle, I want you to trust me with this. And so, unlike ever before, I hit my knees and I prayed that God would would intervene and just keep my mind free of depression and that he would keep my my baby healthy because I knew that I couldn't do it. I knew that I couldn't control this. And God did. He, He blessed my prayers and I had a very healthy pregnancy. With, with no bouts of depression or anxiety at all. And uh, our daughter, Abigail, she just turned a year old. And I can say that I have not been on any medication for depression and anxiety since the moment I found out that I was pregnant. And yeah, there have been some things that have happened 
since then that would normally have triggered a, a full panic attack or caused me to, to shut down like I had done before. And I'm sure that I could always have that tendency in my life. But what has changed is my absolute dependence on God to provide a way out of those thoughts in those moments because He did that for me. And I've learned, I'm still learning that the depression is very real and it, it hurts. It can come on all of a sudden and overwhelmingly just take hold of your mind, sometimes for no reason at all. But God is bigger than depression. He's bigger than panic attacks. And He's bigger than those moments when you feel like you can't take another breath because it hurts too bad. He was sitting right there beside me, holding my hand and helping me breathe through it. And He'll do that for you. He did and always will provide a way out. His grace is more than sufficient. Would you help me thank Danielle for sharing her story? Danielle is one of our worship leaders, and I'm so thankful that she was willing to share her story with us to help remove the stigma of mental illness from the church. Well, I want to welcome you to part two of Suicidal, a series we started last weekend. I want to say hello to all of you joining us via video at all of our campuses, or if you're watching on TV. Church Online or one of our network churches, uh, we're glad that you're joining us uh, for this very important series as well. We said last weekend that suicide affects us all, doesn't it? We see it in the news, we see it in our schools, middle schools and high schools. We see it in our family, we see it among our friends. It's hard to find somebody that hasn't been impacted by this. And the common road that's uh, frequented by many people that begin to wrestle with some of these suicidal thoughts is, is this one. This is a common road. Difficult circumstances can sometimes lead to sadness, an overwhelming amount of sadness, which can sometimes lead to seeing a doctor and getting a clinical diagnosis of depression, which can then sometimes lead to suicidal thoughts, thinking about taking your own life, and then some people have chosen to act on those thoughts, and tragically, they're not with us here today. But there's others, like Danielle, that have traveled down this road and had some of these thoughts, but instead chose to believe, as she said in the video, that even if she didn't feel like Jesus was with her, even if she felt totally hopeless, she chose to believe that He was, and that He cared, and that He loved her, and that He would help her through this difficult time. And we're gonna share with you more stories uh, like Danielle's throughout this series. What I want to spend some time talking about today, though, is difficult circumstances. We all go through them. So the question is, what do you do when they come? I want to talk to you some about that, but before I get there, I want to review briefly last weekend. Now, a one-minute review isn't going to do justice uh, to what we talked about last weekend, so if you were not here for some reason, I would challenge you to go to our website, experiencelifenow.com, or to YouTube, and watch the video from last weekend. It'll make this talk make even more sense. But uh, last weekend we talked about removing the stigma of mental illness from the church, and I shared with you some troubling statistics. I wanna share a few of those with you again today, just in review. Every year in the United States, more than 36,000 individuals die by suicide. Hundreds of thousands attempt suicide, and millions of friends and loved ones or affected. That's just in our country. This number is about a million a year if you include the whole world. More than 90% of people who die by suicide struggle with depression or some kind of mental illness. More than 90%. One more. I mentioned last week and I got these statistics from the American Psychiatric Association, the Center for Disease Control. But the American Psychiatric Association says that a major barrier to suicide prevention is stigma. This unfair and negative belief about mental illness. And I said last weekend that we've got to remove the stigma of mental illness from the church. The church is sustaining it, and we have to remove the stigma if we really want to see people get help. 
And so many of us put these bands on, maybe if you're new here or it's your first time in this series to come, you've seen some of these around town. It's just an orange band many of us have worn that says not alone, hashtag not alone, is our way of just saying to the world, if you have mental illness, we don't stigmatize you. We don't. And not only that, you're not gonna be alone in your struggle. As a church, we're here to help. So again, the hope last weekend was that for all of us at our church, this stigma would be totally removed. Again, if you missed the talk, uh, you definitely should check it out online. But before we could get into the road, we needed to talk about the stigma so that now with the stigma removed, we can be open, right? And transparent about struggles that we face. So let's do that today as we talk about what do you do when difficult circumstances come? Let's get started. Many cases, you may not realize this, many cases of clinical depression, although not all, many, although not all, are preceded by a difficult circumstance or a series of difficult circumstances. So some examples would be like the loss of a loved one, somebody close to you or yourself being diagnosed with a serious illness, a financial difficulty, a broken relationship. If you were to talk to people that have been clinically depressed, many, not all, many could identify a trigger, some difficult circumstance that kind of put them in this downward spiral that it, you know, ended up causing them to be diagnosed with clinical depression. So. Our response to our difficult circumstances can make us more likely or less likely to head down a path toward a diagnosis of clinical depression. We all go through difficult circumstances, but we all don't get clinical depression, right? It's important to know when difficult circumstances come how to respond to those. Here, here's what I mean. Your thoughts about your difficult circumstances, if primarily negative and hopeless, it can send you into a downward spiral toward Depression. However, your thoughts about your circumstances, difficult circumstances, if primarily positive and hopeful, can keep you from the downward spiral toward depression. That's why our response, since we all go through difficult circumstances, our response is crucial as to whether or not we end up on this path that can lead to that diagnosis. Here's what I'm not saying, though. Make sure you hear this. Here's what I'm not saying. This is not to say all depression is caused by a negative response to difficult circumstances. We're not saying that. In fact, last weekend, I said Tommy Nelson, Pastor Tommy Nelson's case, he didn't realize he had a difficult circumstance. So he didn't have, he'd have anything to respond negatively to until after he was diagnosed with clinical depression and recognized it might have been his schedule. But it wasn't a negative response to anything. He just got clinically depressed and it, it wasn't necessarily due to this. However, here's what we are saying. A negative response to a difficult circumstance or to difficult circumstances could definitely make depression worse whatever the cause. So whatever the cause of somebody's depression might be, if they add to that negative thinking, hopeless thinking, it definitely can make it worse. And so that's why I thought it'd be very important for us today to talk about what the Bible says about how to respond, how to think about the difficult circumstances that we face in our lives. And here's my hope in this message, it's twofold. Here's my hope, number one, that some who are on the road toward clinical depression would get off the road today. If you recognize the causation for you is maybe not uh, genetic or initially physiological, but just uh, negative thinking, my hope is if you're on the road, you recognize you're in the downward spiral that you'd exit off the road today and, there, and therefore not end up with that clinical diagnosis. And then two, some who are already clinically depressed, my hope is this would keep it from getting worse and possibly you'd experience symptom improvement, improvement as you think about how am I thinking about my circumstances and how should I biblically. So I think this is gonna be really important and really helpful to all of us wherever we're at in life. So if you got a Bible, Romans chapter five. Let's go together. Romans five was written by a guy named Paul. You may not have known, but he used to persecute Christians. He hated them. He would try to imprison as many as, many as he could. He wanted them dead. He admitted that. And that was until he saw Jesus risen from the dead, realized he had gotten the whole Jesus thing wrong, overnight suddenly changed and becomes a follower of Jesus, an influential leader in the church and writes almost half of the ancient documents in our New Testament. God inspires him to write this letter, very important letter in the New Testament to the believers in a town called Rome. And in chapter five, he talks to them about 
what do you do when difficult circumstances come? So we would do well to listen to Paul so that when they come, we think biblically. Romans 5. Beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Now, this is amazing if you don't see it already. Therefore, what Paul's trying to do is briefly summarize what just happened in Romans 1 to 4. In Romans chapters 1 to 4, Paul shares with him the greatest news in history, the gospel. And he sums it up by saying this. Here's the gospel. We're made right in God's sight by faith in what Jesus has done for us. We are not, this is not the gospel, we are not made right in God's sight by works or things we have done for ourselves. That's what a lot of people think. We're made right with God by being a good enough person. It's not true. That's not, the, that's not good news, though, if you think about it. Good people go to heaven. Some people think that. It's not true. It's not good news, because how would you know how good is good enough? How would you know if you're really going to make it? That's not good news. What's good news is you can know for sure on the basis of faith in Jesus that you're right with God. And here's what a lot of times people don't get. Jesus was perfect. We're not. And the standard for heaven is moral perfection. So our only chance of getting there is if we offer to God or present to God a record of righteousness that's not our own, because we're not good enough. The great news of the gospel is Jesus offers us his record of righteousness. You know why he came and lived a perfect life? It wasn't he had anything to prove. He lived the perfect life, a perfect life, so that it could be credited to your account. That's what Paul's been saying, Romans 1 to 4. So that you're acceptable to God, not on the basis of your own record of righteousness. You wouldn't be on that basis. You're acceptable to God on the basis of Jesus' record of righteousness that you've received by faith as a free gift. That's amazing news. And then you can know for sure you're going to heaven because you're not presenting your own record of righteousness. It's Jesus's. He says, that's the gospel. And he said, it results in peace with God. A lot of people these days looking for peace with God. If you had asked them, hey, do you think you're at peace with God? They'd say, no, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like me and God are right. The gospel says you can be made right with God on the basis of receiving Christ's righteousness, earned for you by him living a perfect life, by faith as a gift. He keeps going. Verse two, this is awesome. Result of the gospel, because of our faith, not our works, not because we've been good enough, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. So watch this. Because of the gospel, God adopts us when we receive the gospel, believe in Jesus, commit our lives to Jesus. He adopts us into his family, making us a child of his, and therefore we are in a place of undeserved privilege as a child of a great king. He loves us, and we're heirs of his. And so we get an inheritance, and Paul's saying it's God's glory. It's eternal life. It's getting to be with God. If you've committed your life to Christ, you're in a place of undeserved privilege. And it's like Paul saying, you got to get this right first before we get to the verses on how you handle difficult times. you got to remember in anything you go through, hey, I'm a child of a great king who loves me and who's going to take care of me and who's going to be there for me. I'm in a place of undeserved privilege. It's important to remember that. How do you get this place of undeserved privilege? It's only by faith. This is a prerequisite. What we're saying is a prerequisite to what Paul is fixing to say. What Paul's fixing to say is only for those who have received Christ's righteousness by faith. So we got to start there. My question for you, first of all today, is have you made that decision? Have you committed your life to Christ? because it starts there. Don't try to present your own record of righteousness to God. It, 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 the Bible says it's not acceptable to him. Receive Christ's record of righteousness, present that, and we're acceptable to God. Not because of what we've done, because of what he did. At any point in the service, you can just say, Jesus, I receive it. And you can walk out of the service today knowing you're right with God by faith, not by your works. And now you're in a place of undeserved privilege. That's the greatest news in history. And Paul starts there. Then he keeps going. So what do we do, okay? Difficult times come. I'm a child of a king. What do we do? This is what he says. We can rejoice. 
what? No, Paul, come on, man, what? We can rejoice, he says, too, when we run into problems and trials, when we go through difficult times in life, when we have difficult circumstances. Paul's saying, as a child of a king in a place of undeserved privilege, we can rejoice. Now, that's the opposite, right, of what we're taught whether it's by our parents or our friends or society, society teaches you when things go wrong and you experience difficult circumstances, what are you supposed to do? Freak out, panic, right? You're, that's what we're taught. Paul says, you don't have to do that. If you're in a place of undeserved privilege, you can rejoice when this difficult circumstance comes, when we run into problems and child, tr trials. It's not if, church. We've said this many times here before. It's not if you run into problems and trials. In this life, in this fallen world, we run into problems and trials. You will. I will. Paul says, here's how you can respond. If you're a child of a great king, you can rejoice. Now, in case you're going, Chris, I don't get it. And what I'm going through now, there is nothing to rejoice about. What are you talking about? He tells us how, how to rejoice. Watch. We can rejoice when we have difficult circumstances, for we can know something. We can preach to ourselves and we can believe something that's true instead of maybe believing some of the things we've been told that, is, that are not true. For we can know that this helps us, these trials and difficult circumstances, they help us develop endurance. They're not good. We're not saying they're good, but they can do something good in us. They can develop endurance meaning they can help you endure to the end, stand firm in the faith, stay close to Jesus till the very end. Problems and trials do that. Here's what you know, and here's what I know. When you're pretty comfortable in life, when there aren't many trials and difficult circumstances in your life, what usually happens with your relationship with God? Just be honest, what happens? We have a tendency to drift, don't we? When things are great, even though we believe in God, we realize we don't really need him that much because things are good and we can tend to drift. What brings you right back to him? Problems and trials. I can prove it. Think about why you started coming to this church for the first time. Here's what I've heard from many people. Hadn't been in church for a while, maybe hadn't been in church ever. And in life, they hit what? problems and trials. And so they come to a church or they get involved in a church. Why? Because they're recognizing they, they need to get closer to God again. They've drifted and they need him because they're going through a difficult time. And so the problems and the trials, the difficult circumstances, they draw us back. Paul's not saying they're good. He's just saying they can do something good in you if you run to God rather than from him. But that's not all. He said you can rejoice because they develop endurance. He keeps going. And endurance, here's what it does, it develops strength of character. So not only do these difficult circumstances draw you close to Jesus, they make you more like Jesus. It strengthens your character. Maybe you've said this before, you went through a difficult time in life, a difficult circumstance, and you say, you know what? Without that, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. You ever heard somebody say that before? And what they're saying is, hey, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I wish I didn't have to go through it, but look at what it did to my character trials and problems not only draw us close to Jesus, they can make us more like Jesus. And third, one more thing he says, this is great, and character, becoming more like Jesus, strengthens our confident hope of salvation. In other words, he's saying they draw you close to Jesus, they make you more like Jesus, and they assure you that one day you're going to be with Jesus and he's going to fix all this. Our pain and our suffering, it doesn't last forever. We get to go to a place where there's no more pain and depression and sickness and suffering and cancer and, and death. Like he's coming to our rescue. Hold on. Hold on. He's coming to our rescue. Draws us close to Jesus. Makes us more like Jesus and assures us one day he's going to make all things new. He's going to make this right. Jesus is going to come. He's going to fix this. And so Paul says in knowing that, in preaching that to yourself, in believing that, you can rejoice. You can do the opposite of what everybody else is doing when difficult circumstances come. You can rejoice. So, you get diagnosed with a serious illness. Hey, this is gonna be tough, but I'm in a place of undeserved privilege. 
I'm a child of a king. You can draw me close to Jesus, make me more like Jesus, assure me one day I'm be with Jesus. I'm not going to deal with this illness ever again. Broken relationship. Hey, this is tough, man, this is tough. But I'm in a place of undeserved privilege as a child of a great king. You can draw me close to Jesus, make me more like Jesus one day. God's going to fix this. I'm going to be in a place where there's no more broken relationships. So I can rejoice. Don't you see how this can keep you from the downward spiral that, lead, that can lead to a diagnosis of clinical depression where you're thinking instead of this, instead of Romans 5 thinking, you're going, my life's terrible. My life's falling apart. Is there a point in living? I can't, this difficult circumstance came and now I don't know what to do. I mean, everybody hates me. Is there any reason to live? I mean, that's the opposite direction, right? That's the direction you don't want to go. Paul's saying the direction you should go is Romans 5 thinking. It, it can change everything. It can, it can help. It can help. Now, I wish as your pastor that I could get up here and tell you um, that I've always thought like Romans 5 tells us to think, but I have not. And I've had to learn this over the years and uh, with God's grace um, be helped into thinking this way. But I want to spend the rest of my time today just telling you my story. So seven years ago, uh, we started this church, my wife and I. And really before that time, if I'm being honest, I don't re remember a time in my life where I was ever really that stressed out about anything, where I was ever really worried or anxious about anything. I don't really remember a time like that. But once we started the church alone, some of you might could identify if you started a business or something alone, the stress started to pile on. Again, we were alone, so I was having to do everything in the early days. I was knocking on doors, inviting people to come to the church. We were throwing block parties. I was trying to fundraise. I was doing accounting. I'd actually passed out some flyers in my neighborhood saying, I will fix your computer for free if I can tell you about this new church. I was that desperate. Okay, like I'm trying, I'm trying to encourage people to come. I'm buying the chairs for the place we're going to meet, trying to find the facility where we can meet, trying to lead the small groups. I mean, it's wonderful, it's amazing, but it was uh, very uh, stressful. Well, add to that, the church starts and it blows up. It starts growing quickly. It hasn't stopped, if you haven't noticed. It's been growing so fast. But, you know, our giving has never kept up with our growth. So even now, what we bring in at Experience Life now is far less than most churches of our size. And it was that way in the early days. So we needed more staff to do all that we had to do, but we couldn't afford them. We could only afford a couple. And so brought a few guys on and then we did everything and worked long hours doing a couple people's jobs just because things were exciting and, you know, it was just us. It's stressful, though. And then you add to that the stress for an introvert of having to speak in front of a bunch of people each weekend, okay? Some of y'all hear me like, you're an extrovert. I know you are. Life of the party. You would be wrong, okay? I'm an introvert. This is not easy for sure, just something I feel like God called me to do. And some of you can probably understand because you took a speech class in high school or college and you'd rather kiss a snake than ever have to do that again, okay? So you can maybe kind of feel my pain, all right. So it's pretty stressful. And this went on for about two years. And about two years into it, there was an event that made me start thinking that uh, my body wasn't able to keep the pace that I was setting. I was in Corpus Christi, me and some Staff members went down there to learn from a church there. There's a few steps ahead of us. Me and Clayton were in the back of a truck, and the pastor was driving us around showing us their different uh, campuses. Clayton, one of our pastors, our Southwest Campus pastor. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, things were great, felt great. Out of nowhere, I felt sharp shooting pain in my chest. I never had that before. And it kind of freaked me out. I didn't know what that was. And I felt like I was hit in the stomach with a baseball bat. I just... <gasps> My breath was taken. I couldn't, I, I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I started shaking. I thought, what in the world? And Clayton could tell something was wrong. He said, are you okay? I said, I don't know, man. I thought I just got attacked by something. I said, I think we need to stop at a convenience store and let me get some medicine. <clears throat> so we stopped at this store. I get some aspirin thinking if something's wrong with my heart, that maybe that would help. And it didn't really help. It didn't pass. Clayton said, do you want us to take you to the hospital? I said, no. I should have said yes. But I said, no, I... I'll, I'll be okay, I think. And uh, I wasn't okay. As we went around to the different uh, campuses, 
the guys were getting a tour of the building and I was in the bathroom just trying to catch my breath. I just felt like I couldn't breathe. I was calling my wife. And, and then all these negative thoughts started coming through my mind. Am I gonna die? Am I having a heart attack? What if I don't get back home to my family? How, who's gonna provide for my family? I got home, made it through the rest of the trip, although not well. I got home and it passed. So then I just associate it with traveling. I'm like, okay, that's weird. I go out of town, all this happens to me, so maybe I shouldn't travel that much because this is obviously not good. But a few months after that, we had another trip planned to Atlanta uh, for a conference. And I really wanted to go, and as we got closer to this conference, I started having these thoughts like, what if I go to that conference and it happens again? What if that thing that attacked me, that took my breath away, what if it happens again and was getting, as you can tell, into the downward spiral? Hopped on a plane, got to Atlanta, sat in this stadium of like 15,000 other people at this conference. And I felt all of a sudden, like it started caving in on me and this thing attacked me again and I felt like I couldn't breathe. So I get up, I got up and I started walking around and it was bad. Got on an airplane to come back home and I was sitting across the aisle from Clayton and Brandon, two of our pastors. And Clayton would tell you, he thought I looked like a corpse. I was pale, I looked sick, I was bent over and uh, was just, not feeling well. We get back to Lubbock and then it passes again. Like, what is this? That was on Friday. On Saturday, I had to speak two times. We used to, some of you were here, we used to have five services, two on Saturday, three on Sunday. I had this thought Friday night after getting home because I was kind of panicked by all these symptoms. I didn't know where they were coming from. And I had the thought, what if what's been happening to me when I travel happens to me in the middle of a message? What do I do in the middle of a message if I can't breathe and my chest starts hurting and I feel like I'm gonna pass out and faint? And so downward spiral. Got to the five o'clock, made it through. Hit the 6.30 p.m. on Saturday night. Got halfway through the message and it attacked me. Chest pain, shortness of breath, shaking. I walked right off the stage, right in the middle of the message. Grabbed my bag and rushed myself to the emergency room. I got to the emergency room. My blood pressure was through the roof. They put me in a wheelchair on my leg. I couldn't hardly feel my legs. I couldn't walk, put me in a wheelchair. It got me to a hospital, but I had to go to the bathroom, but I couldn't like walk. So thankfully in hospitals, they know how to do that. Okay, I mean, it's just too much information, but sorry. So that, ha that happened. It wasn't funny, but it kind of is now. And so, I mean, I, I was sick. I couldn't hardly walk. And so they put me on IV and on oxygen and all of this. They run all these tests on my heart, you know, thinking there's something wrong with his heart, but I'm so young that they were thinking that's probably not it. And all the tests, the ER doctor told me, came back negative. He asked him about my life. I told him about the last couple of years. And he said, Chris, I think what's causing these weird physical manifestations is that you are just overwhelmed by stress and you're gonna have to slow down and your body's gonna have to rest. He said, what I would recommend you do is go home and immediately make an appointment with your doctor. Talk about this. So at that point, I'm desperate. I know I need help. I make an appointment with my doctor, I go see the doctor, and he basically said the same thing. He said, Chris, those physical manifestations that then is kind of causing you to panic, they're called, it's called a panic attack. It's called an anxiety attack. He said, it's likely been brought on by years of compounded stress. And he said, Chris, if you don't rest, if you don't, st if you don't put the brakes on and stop for a little bit, you could end up clinically depressed to where you're even less functional than you are now. Well, Clayton, remembers coming into that hospital room, seeing me lying there looking terrible. And he thought to himself, he would tell you this, he thought to himself, I think the church could be over. I was just, I was, I had no life in me. I was just out. And uh, so negative thoughts continued to come. What if I can't speak again? This happened in the middle of a sermon. What if I can't speak again? What if the church is over? What are we gonna do then? So saw the doctor and the doctor said, Chris, uh, I think in addition to getting some rest, you need to take this. And he gave me some medication that he said I could take as needed. That when I felt those physical manifestations, I, it would, it would uh, alleviate it a little bit and allow me to think well and, and function. And so I was glad to have that. At the same time, I made an appointment with a counselor and recognized that even if I couldn't control these physical manifestations, maybe because my body was overwhelmed by stress, what I could control was my response to them. I could choose to do Romans 5 thinking rather than panic like I had 
been doing. And so with the help of a counselor and my Bible and prayer, I was able to start thinking like Paul says we should in Romans 5. I took about five, six weeks off, I think. I'm sure the staff wondering, it's just a few of us at that time, I'm sure they were wondering, is he ever going to speak again? Is he going to make it back? And after a series of weeks and going through all of this, I just decided I, I, I want to try this again. Let's try it again with a new way of thinking. If I get up there and I have the symptoms, I can't control that, but I cannot panic. I can know it's going to be okay. It's not in my heart. And I can do Romans 5 thinking and think, hey, I'm a child of a great king. I'm in a place of undeserved privilege. This is going to be okay even if I don't feel okay. It's going to draw me close to Jesus, make me more like Jesus, and assure me one day I'm going to be with Jesus and not even have to deal with this. And uh, so by the grace of God, about five weekends after, I came back and I spoke and I made it through. And then the next weekend I came back and thanks. And the next weekend came back and made it through and the next weekend came back and, and made it through only by the grace of God though and the help of a doctor and a counselor and changing my way of thinking. The physical manifestations didn't go away overnight. My body was sick. It needed to rest and recover. But what could change was the way I was processing and responding to these physical manifestations. Since then, I started to travel again. It initially, it was kind of nerve-wracking. And many of you know, I just recently went on a trip to Thailand, which was, if you knew, if you knew me and all this whole story, you knew it was a big deal because I'd had so many terrifying experiences traveling before. So to make that long of a trip is a big deal. But I knew my body was healthy enough. And I knew that if I started having negative thoughts, I could go Romans 5 with it. And I could choose to believe the truth rather than to believe the lies that were filling my mind. The reason I tell you all this is just I wanted you to know you've got a friend in this struggle. I may be your pastor, but I'm also struggling to live this out too. And when difficult circumstances come my way, I'm trying to go, no, I'm not going to believe the lies. That's just going to make things worse. I'm going to believe what's true, that I'm in a place of undeserved privilege as a child of a great king. And God's going to do something awesome in my life through this difficult time. You know, that's just what I chose to believe. And that's what you can choose to believe as well. So I challenge you even this week, choose to believe what Romans 5 says rather than what your mind or your thoughts or telling you in any difficult circumstance that you face. Because here's the bottom line, they're gonna come your way. Difficult circumstances are, and you're gonna be tempted to think the opposite of Romans 5. My life's falling apart, there's no point in living, what is this? Don't go that direction. Believe what's true, and what's true is Romans 5. And train your mind to think that way, rather than in the negative and hopeless way that can then put you in the downward spiral toward a clinical diagnosis of depression challenge you to try it this week in the difficult circumstances you face. Next weekend, I want to talk about the next stop along the road, sadness. Sometimes difficult circumstances lead to sadness. What do you do when sadness comes? What do you do when you're overwhelmed with grief? We're going to talk about it. And then one more thing, to those of you here that are sick today with a mental illness, you're depressed, maybe you haven't told anybody because of the stigma, maybe you've thought about hurting yourself. Remember, no stigma here. Would you tell us? We'd love to pray for you and help you find a good counselor or a good doctor? Would you find a pastor at the Next Step Center and tell them that you're sick and you're struggling and you've never told anybody? No stigma here. You're not alone. We want to be here for you as a church, so please let us know before you walk out of the building today. Let me conclude with that great verse in Romans chapter 5, and then I'll pray. Remind yourself of this. Don't forget it. Romans 5, 2, because of your faith in Jesus Christ has brought you into a place of undeserved privilege. He's a child of a great king where we now stand and we can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. I'm telling you, church, that's a great hope. That brings hope in very dark times. Jesus brings hope, and he'll bring it to you as well. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for these scriptures, so powerful. And I just pray today, Jesus, for anybody who's struggling in deep, dark depression, that they'd see a glimmer of hope. Jesus, that you bring them hope. And God, we know whether we're clinically depressed now or on that road or not on that road, we know that negative thought patterns can make everything worse. And so God, would you help us to think like Romans 5 
and not the opposite of Romans 5. God, we need your help. It's only by your grace that I, I've been able to do it sometimes and I still struggle. So we need your grace to help us, God. Give us all the help we need to think like Paul tells us to think, like you inspire Paul to tell us to think in Romans 5. We trust you, Lord. We can't wait to see what you do in our lives as we do Romans 5 thinking. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.